I get to show what I see. I get to have a point of view. I get to present something that I've had in my head. I saw something in my head and then I put it on paper. Okay, we're back. Welcome back, everybody, to the Art Dimensions podcast, Beyond the Palette. I'm Whitney Rosenson, your host and president of Art Dimensions in Los Angeles. My website is artdimensionsonline.com, an easy one to remember, so be sure to check it out. Today, I'm talking with Brent Henry Martin, a versatile photographer with a passion for interior, architectural, and travel image creation from an editorial approach. Brent is a new photographer for Art Dimensions, and I am super excited to get to know him better. His commercial photography and creative content studio is called Sugar High LTD. Brent shoots commercial and residential spaces and has also worked with national and global consumer brands to create amazing visual campaigns. Whether using visual or still photography, Brent captures complex narratives that leave a viewer changed. So let's dive in. Welcome, Brent. How are you doing? I'm well, thanks. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm good. Thank you so much for chatting with me today on Beyond the Palette and giving the listeners a glimpse into your creative world. All right, let's just start at the beginning of your career. If you can think back right now, can you give the listeners a brief snapshot of your journey to where you are today? Sum up. I've done a lot of different things uh, when I was young. The thing I really aspired to be was retired because I loved my grandparents so much. And then after that, it was, you know, I want to do something that's going to be fun. So I started off as a photographer. I, I moved from rural Colorado to Seattle, Washington in the fall of 1991. And I was a newly minted photographer, award-winning young person with big eyes and wet behind the ears. And I moved to Seattle and there was a lot of cool things going on. I was working in commercial uh, photo printing and doing things there. And my career changed when I decided to go to college. And then my parents were like, yeah, we don't really think that the art world is something that you can make any money at. And so you should go do something, you know, pragmatic. And so I went and studied. I have a two-year degree in deaf studies from Seattle Central Community College. And then I went to the University of Washington uh, after that. And then I studied speech pathology and audiology. And all the while, I really wanted to do something more creative. At the time, I was working as a barista in, in Seattle in the 1990s. Coffee ruled everything. And then I kind of got into that world for a long time and got out of it 15 years later after owning my own business. And I wanted to get back into photography. And at that point, I didn't know what to do. And so I went into the world of personal styling. And most of my, so I worked with mostly women clients and mostly affluent and or uh, women in business. And then while I was doing that, I was learning the digital aspect. Because when I went into photography, it was the, the world of film. And then I got out. And then it went into the world of digital. And so I had to go learn all the digital stuff. So I was keeping myself employed by doing uh, personal styling for women. And then as I got better with my technique and things like that, with the digital stuff, I was able to get work thanks to a lot of people that helped me. And one of which was my wife who hired me to do a couple things. Doing that, it was able to like get me some credibility. And oh yeah, this person is, is good. Oh, that's so cool. So your wife helped you years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she helps me every day. Let's be honest. <laughs> don't we, don't we? How long have you been shooting? Commercial, well, making my living at it, not terribly long, uh, less than 10 years. But I've been shooting since I was, well, I'm 50 now. I've been shooting since I was 14, 15 years old. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And you shoot commercial spaces and residential spaces. Right. Yeah. I, you know, when you start out, you take what you can get. And so I was doing a lot of interesting stuff, mostly lifestyle content, 
light lifestyle content, I would say. It's really, there was a lot of stuff that that was used by companies for their Instagram, commercial Instagram stuff. And then I was able to shoot a lot of different things because when you're creating content for a lot of different brands, doing you have to kind of be malleable and you have to be able to adapt and they want something like this now but then the next campaign is going to be something totally different and they want to use you because they like you and so you I kind of had to learn a few things really quickly and what I found was the things that I really loved photographing the most or the things that I found myself photographing the most when I wasn't working was buildings and interiors and I just love that kind of stuff yeah can you tell us about some of the different series that you have? You just recently created a series that was taken in Washington state, I believe. Right. So that's really the first, that's the first true series that I put together. It's a series called Wash Tuckna. Uh, thanks to you. I'm going to, I'm working on getting it all put together and kind of dusted off. And it's a series of photographs that I took in a little town called Washtuckna that is in the Eastern eastern Washington area. And I took these photographs in, I wanna say it was February of 2017, 2018, I can't remember exactly. It was really cold. And there was this little town that was just looking like nobody lived there anymore. It was a ghost town, but it was still there. And there were still things going on, and but barely. And so I was kind of moved by that town as I, I grew up in a very small town, similar to that town in Colorado. So the buildings reminded me a lot of the town that I grew up in and, and the kind of the story of what's happening to farms and farming in rural America. There was a familiar story there and I, and I just kind of stayed in the town for a little while and kind of absorbed it a little bit because it felt familiar. Very cool. How many images in that series? Seven individual images in there. Images, there's five of buildings in town. And there's two images on the edge of town where there's a, a silo of a farmer has a si you know, silos all over, over small little grain silos that they store corn and things. And, um, and then there's an, a power plant that is a transfer power plant station taken in. And all of it in, is just prior to a massive winter storm coming across the Palouse there. Really? I mean, that series sounds really interesting. What other series do you have available Moving to Los Angeles from Seattle has changed some of my work. And before I moved here, someone said, hey, you're going to, your work's going to change. And it did. It's the light. The light changed. Everything changed when I moved here for light. And so I'm right now currently working on a series of, that is capturing some unique architectural things about Los Angeles that I'm not ready to talk about out loud yet, but there's some really unique architectural things about Los Angeles. There's so many cool things, but there's, I think, an, there's something specific that I'm currently working on that I think is underappreciated. Oh, but what is it about these buildings in Washtuckna? Is that the name of the town? Mm -hmm. Or what is it about buildings in general that, that really entice you? When I was young, I loved drawing and I loved drawing buildings and pretending like I was able to build buildings or design a house or cities. And I've always been interested in, in urban infrastructure, which sounds so nerdy and weird, but because it, it is, but I'm also, I love geometry and I love when I most, when you see my work, I think that the first thing that jumps out is it's very geometric and it's very, I lean on geometry. I lean on shapes. My, I see things in shapes and, and I try to make my photographs look the same, whether they're in focus or not. Meaning you can see the shapes, like even if they weren't in focus, what you would see is color and shapes and light in particular ways that if you didn't see the details in it, it would still look right. It would still look in proportion and designed and captured in our photo way, yeah. Wow, fantastic. Um, okay, so describe your aesthetic in three words. Would you say geometric? Would you say? I would say geometric. I love photorealism in painting. Okay. I'm inspired by photorealism in painting. 
in a lot of ways, but it, I wouldn't say that my work is photorealistic. It's, you know, definitely photography, but I would say banality. I love Stephen Shore, just his capturing of what is the most banal space, but it can be so beautiful. And he, he works in geometry, but Julius Shulman is also another influence. And so his work wasn't anything like Stephen Shore, but yet I'm, those two people are the, what I'm most drawn to. And so I would say that's probably just the, geom the geometric aspect of, their, of my work is what I love the most. Okay, thank you for explaining that. How do you spell Shore, Stephen Shore, if people want to look it up? Oh, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, and it's S-H-O-R-E. Okay, like, okay. Yeah, S-H-O-R-E, yeah. Okay. Brent, what inspires you to create and to continue creating to this day? Wow, what inspires me to create? I There's a lot to get out, <laughs> I guess. I'm not inspired to create. I just create. I just do the things that I do because I do them and I like them. I don't know if I'm inspired by yeah I would say you're inspired by nature but mm -hmm. by architecture you know um I mean that's pretty general yeah but I would say like yeah like I just I those things inspire me at least the, the things that I do create but I'm constantly doing uh, I'm doing things I'm I'm always trying to create something or working around my house to build something over here or create this space over there so I'm yeah I'm always trying to do something around just yeah building something or yeah putting something together very nice I want to go back to the the global brands that you shot can you mm -hmm. name those brands are they ones that we would have heard of, heard of there are some local, like in living in the Northwest, there are some brands that were local brands that are national. Like I did a, some work for Chateau Saint-Michel um, and the work that I did for them is kind of, they have their Chateau Saint-Michel and then they have their other brands that they have. And so it was creating a lot of, wor of work for wine brands and that was super fun. But then I did some work with Brother where we created had a crew and we um, was part of a crew that did 300 individual images for brother in three weeks yeah no so it was what we were doing was some like label makers and they had a they had these ribbon printers that were like label makers so you could like create your own ribbon and so we had to come up with all these creative things we had 300 of them and yeah it was amazing and that was a fun group to work with. Um, I did some things with McDonald's for their global McDelivery Day a few a few years ago. And it was fun. We got to photograph some of the McDonald's product that was that was really fun and you know rare and everybody was dying to get their hands on it. And then that was a fun shoot because it was shooting food and it was my first time shooting food and in a real serious way. And then of course it's McDonald's. And so of course they're very specific about their food. So it was really fun to do all of those things. It was really fun. That's so fascinating. What is your favorite aspect about being a photographer? I get to show what I see. I get to have a point of view. I get to present something that I've had in my head. I saw something in my head and then I put it on paper or I put it on in a screen in many ways now, but I prefer print work. And so that's what I love. I love the act of this is what I have in my head. And then this is what I can create. And then creating it, whatever way that is from start to finish. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Now, what would you say is the hardest part about being a photographer? figuring out what to say, figuring out what to do. <laughs> I think honestly, like, what is it that you, what is it you want to shoot? What is it that you want to say? What is it that you need to get out? What is it like, that's the hardest thing for me is like, well, what's next? Cause I'm, I like to push myself to do different things and to see things differently. And I'm in a, I'm in a spot right now where I'm changing and my work is changing a little bit. And so I'm pushing myself. I'm looking at light in a different way. I'm looking at construction in a different way in 
how I'm putting things together in the frame. And I'm having some new ideas about how to use this really beautiful light that we get here in Los Angeles. You've just explained a bit, but what are you up to these days in your studio? Is there a new series that you're working on? It's that Architectural Los Angeles. The Architectural Los Angeles, I'm actually working on something not anything to do with photography. I'm doing oh. this work called Kintsugi. And it's a Japanese art of repairing ceramics. And for the last few years, I've been teaching myself Kintsugi by reading everything I get my hands on, watching anything I can find on, online. And a lot of times it has to be, you know, I have to translate it or whatever. And I, so I could probably find somebody in this big city of ours to help me, but that wouldn't be any fun to me. I want to learn how to do it. I want to want to make the mistakes. And so I've been doing that and I got to a point now where I'm actually reasonably good at it. And so I've been doing a lot of work. And so my friends have been giving me broken pieces of pottery and I've been been doing that. So I'm going to start photographing them. I think I'm going to start playing with some light in the studio. And I think it's another, it's just another thing. I've, I've always wanted to be interesting at dinner parties. That was my goal in life after retirement. And so, yeah, so I was like, okay, well, let me, let's try this. And so, so I'm, that's what I'm doing in my studio now. Can you explain the, the philosophy behind Kitsugi? It's Kitsugi. Kintsugi. Yeah. So Kintsugi is part of the wabi-sabi kind of embracing of the flawed. And which is what I love. Um, I love also the aspect of, of repairing things. I, I like things worn. I like things comfortable. I like things put together and polished. And what I love about Kintsugi and Wabi Sabi is that you embrace the flaws, you highlight the flaws, and then the flaws become the beauty. The flaws become the uniqueness. So for instance, the bowl, I'm doing a, a series, a set right now where somebody brought to me there, they have a one-year-old and they had this ceramic set plate bowl cup. And it was from somebody, someplace in, in Sweden that somebody sent them and then the bowl broke. And so I'm putting it together and it's beautiful and now it's together. And it's now a little more special because it's got a story to it and it's unique and it's, yeah. So that's the, that's the idea that I like behind Wabi Sabi. Thank you for explaining that. How long has it been around? Centuries, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, the the one of the things that you you use to as an adhesive is the urushi tree sap. So they use an, a sap that comes out of a tree, and they've been and it, you use that with various fillers of you know wood chips or cotton or different things to help do different kind of mending processes. And then using all of that stuff, I mean, I'm sure that the, the Japanese have been studying and learning all that stuff for years and years and years and years. So yeah, it's all very natural and it's all, everything's like what you have around you. It's, I, I this bowl that I um, showed you, I broke it and then I fused the pieces together and I highlighted each crack with a gold, with gold paint. So gold paint. right. Yeah. Anyway, I, I do know what, what it is, and I love that project. If you were granted a million dollars for an art project, what would you do? I wouldn't do an art project. I would instead, I would help artists. So my wife and I, my wife's family is from the Philippines, and my wife is a, is a very successful creative executive. And we have a couple of projects that we want to work on. And one of the things that we want to do is create a place in the Philippines because there's so much creativity that goes underutilized in the Philippines because it's a poor country and no other reason. There's a lot of things that can go a long way with a little bit of money. And so one of the things I would do is try to give kids opportunities that I didn't have. So I, my, you know, my parents were very pragmatic and they wanted me to do something very pragmatic as a career. And yet here I am as an artist anyway, letting them know that there is a future in art, that nothing in the world 
doesn't get touched by a designer or an artist of some variety because there's so much creativity there and it's under underutilized one of the things we want to do is is create an art school there to help young people in the Philippines understand that the creative things that they have going on are not only valuable but have a value and and how to how do you reach that commercial market for your talent your skill your your ability can you tell us about drone photography i know you have a license in using drones yeah so what do you use the drones for and what is it exactly during the pandemic what am i going to do move to a new city don't know anybody don't know how to work so I, I looked into, well, what can I do to expand my, my skill set? And I got a Part 107 FAA drone license. And what that means is I'm licensed to fly drones by the FAA. And I've done a bunch of schoolwork and I've taken tests and I know the when it's okay and when it's not okay to fly a drone and how to properly file a flight plan do wow. all those things. And so it's not hard, but it's important. And so they really take it seriously. And so a lot of times you'll find photographers that don't have a license or um, will offer services and you, you know, they may be really, really good at their job, but it's one of those things where if you have the wherewithal to go ahead and just do all of the licensure, you're probably going to end up with somebody who's going to probably have a little easier time to have business with and go through all of the things that need to be gone through safety wise to make sure that you're you're getting everything that you're asking this photographer to do and that they do it with your name in a safe way okay the drone shoots aerially so the drone goes up and then the, there's a gimbal on the drone and you can move that around or you can adjust your height and things. There's, of course, there's a lot of regulations about how close or how far away you can be from buildings and over people and things like that. Yeah, so there's a lot of, of things around that you have to be aware of. It's fun, but the one thing that always happens is um, when you're flying a drone, you're a target. People see you. And so I've had to, to do a few evasive things when people come up and they want to talk to you and, you, and I can't talk to you because, <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Do you have any advice for emerging photographers who might be listening to this podcast? Just keep shooting. You don't know when the yes is coming and you don't know when the next immaculate idea is going to come. Just keep on going. And for me, I'm lucky because I can do this for a living and I do, but I, I would still be doing something. I would still be creating something. Even if I wasn't getting paid, I would still be out there doing creative things. And, and I think if you are happiest doing creative things, then do them and then everything else will fall into place. I love that. I was going to say something to that effect too. Um, what art do you show in your own house or do you have only your own photographs displayed? I have a mix of stuff. So there are some of my own photographs, but it's, I think mostly they're placeholders for when they need to go out of here to some, somebody else. I prefer to have my work on other people's walls rather than my own. <laughs> my wife and I love collecting bits of art from wherever we travel. And so we've got a bunch of different things. I have this, one of my favorite things is two, well, two of my favorite things. I have a, a fake Yue Minjon painting. And Yue Minjon is a dissident painter from China. And he's noted for the his caricatures of happy people. So you see these big round faces with these broad grins and smiles, which are overly happy and things. Um, and all of his, or big wide open grins. And so you see sculptures and paintings and things. So hip of his, and so I found a fake one in Hong Kong and I just had to have it because it was seven dollars in a market and so I have this weird little thing and I know it's like but it's not his and I realized that there's all of the things that are complicated around that but Yue Minjun is complicated and so I thought he would love this he would love that somebody's doing this so 
I have that and I have other things that are special to us that we pick up around the world and different people we like. So I try not to have my own stuff on the wall. This is just off the cuff. I'm going to ask you for a few questions. Just the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay. What is your favorite color? Hunter green, British racing green, like dark greens right now. Favorite food? Green chili. Favorite season? Um, fall, autumn. Favorite music to listen to? Reggae music. Reggae music. Oh, love it. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you so much for this amazing conversation, Brent. I'm so happy we got to connect here on Beyond the Palette. Everybody, please take a look at his website, www.sugarhigh.ltd, for more information and to see some stunning images. Also, Brent's Instagram handle is at bhenrymartin, so be sure to follow him there. And to learn even more about Art Dimensions and Brent, check out his page on artdimensionsonline.com. On the homepage of the site, click where it says artists in the upper right-hand corner, and then scroll down to Brent's thumbnail and name. Oh. Click that and you'll see his page. All right, before I sign off, Brent, is there anything else you'd like the listeners to know about you? No, I just thank you for the opportunity to come on your show. And thank you for giving me an opportunity to show my work and help me build my career. Thank you. My pleasure. My absolute pleasure. There's also going to be a blog post about Brent's work. So some of these images that we've discussed. Um, so look for that. And I want to thank the listeners for tuning in to be on the palette. I wish you all a superb month and happy creating. <laughs>